We're crisscrossing the country and traveling the globe to find ideas for planting with abundance right after this. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Just look at all of these beautiful flowers. Hi, I'm Alan Smith and welcome to The Garden Home, where you'll find practical ideas, beautiful landscapes, and much, much more to help inspire you to push the boundaries of your home right out into the garden, to the edges of your property. Now, today's show, we're going to focus on abundance, and there's no better place to get excited or inspired by the bounty of the garden than in a garden center or nursery like this. When we plant with gusto or abandon, the results can be outstanding. And don't think you have to have a large space to plant like this. The same results can be achieved by packing in plants in small gardens or even containers. Now we'll get to that a little later. But first, I wanted to go over a few terms that you'll hear throughout the show. The first is garden home. Now a garden home is simply a garden that is an extension of the inside of your home which extends your living space. Whether it's a garden that allows you to dine outdoors, or a garden that provides you with beautiful flowers to bring in for bouquets, or even delicious herbs for cooking. The garden home is all about enjoying and utilizing the space in and around your home. I like to break the garden home down into garden rooms, or small manageable spaces. For instance, in my garden, I've enclosed my fountain garden with a holly hedge. You can see how this part of the garden is both an extension of the home and a small garden all its own. Now when I create garden rooms for a garden home, I always fall back on my 12 principles of design. It makes the task so much easier. Now as you might have guessed, today's topic is on abundance and that's one of the principles. We're also going to talk about another principle called time. Now, I don't mean time in the what hour of the day is it time, I'm talking about history, a little garden history. We're going to look back and see how European style has influenced American gardens with regard to planting with abundance. Like Mount Vernon, just outside Washington, D.C. Let's take a look. If you're interested in getting some good ideas for your garden, one of the best ways to do it is to visit some really great ones like Mount Vernon. You'll find that George Washington was not only the father of our country, he also loved farming and gardens. And you can't forget Martha. She was an enthusiastic gardener as well, and she ran the place most of the time. This is the upper garden, or the pleasure garden, and it was laid out in 1785. And it's full of all sorts of things from Europe and native plants from around this area. Many of these plants are still popular today because they're so tough and easy to grow. Some of the annuals grown here are larkspur and poppies, as well as this interesting flower called love in a mist. As for perennials, there are peonies, bellflowers, and this bright orange one called Maltese cross. You can't believe the aroma in this garden, thanks to these beautiful roses. A garden like this was a luxury back then. Now Martha and George certainly appreciated the beauty of flowers, but it was useful plants, edible plants like herbs and vegetables that played an even larger role here, and they're still growing them here today. Let's take a look. Vegetables were grown for obvious reasons. Everyone likes to eat, and herbs were a big part of the vegetable garden, not only for the table, but as borders around the vegetable beds like these, and the variety they grew here was amazing. The gardens of Mount Vernon are certainly abundant, full of vegetables, flowers, herbs, trees and shrubs, annuals and perennials, while our first president and first lady seem to be interested in growing just about everything. Not so far from Mount Vernon is Williamsburg, Virginia. Colonial Williamsburg was once home to early American ideas of independence and democracy. This historic town has been restored to preserve our colonial past, a snapshot, if you will, of 18th century life. Today it's a living and working town on over 300 acres with more than 500 historic buildings. 
What's interesting to me about this early American colony is that its landscape and gardens were influenced as much by Dutch high style as it was by the English. Laura Vinecour with the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation tells us more. Laura, do you find that visitors have become more interested in the gardens here at Colonial Williamsburg? It's obvious people really do enjoy gardens and enjoy coming here for the gardens. Any time of year. I mean, here we are in December right. and the gardens look great. Although there's not a lot of color, the structure and the design of these gardens are so strong because of their Dutch English influence. When Williamsburg became the capital, William and Mary were on the throne and William being from Holland and Mary from England, they combined their gardening styles and we get that Dutch English influence here. And it lingered very long in the colonies because it was so structured, very symmetrical and linear. And it gave a sense of control to the colonists because what was here was wilderness, which scared them. So that Dutch English, very orderly garden was very popular here long into the 1700s. Although the gardens were very orderly in their arrangement, the arrangement of the plants within were mixed. Colonists didn't segregate plants like we like to with our <laughs> herb gardens and our rose gardens. They were combining these various plants. And even in the pleasure gardens, you would have fruit trees, and herbs, things we typically think about in our kitchen gardens. And I believe that's one way the colonists combated pest problems, just like organic gardeners do today, was mixing different plants up. When visiting gardens throughout Virginia, if there was one signature plant, it seems that it would be the boxwood. Boxwood is the, the primary plant here in Williamsburg, and so many guests come here saying, that they have boxwood in their gardens now because of that. But that goes back again to King William's influence. Because he loved topiary, he used boxwood because it sheared so well. And he would create these very tight um, edgings of boxwood to edge the parterres. The gardens would not be the same without the boxwood, definitely. <laughs> The history of gardens in this country has certainly been influenced by gardening trends from Europe, but a recent visit to the Chicago Botanic Garden proves that American garden designers are making their mark on the world gardening community with a style specializing in natural landscapes. You see, they've dedicated a five-acre garden to a new approach to gardening. It's called the New American Style of Gardening. It's characterized by being informal and relaxed, meadow-like in its planting. It features a wide variety of perennials and ornamental grasses. Just look at this exceptional drift of color set against a background of ornamental grasses. Here we have Peruvian verbena, or I like to call it verbena on a stick, towering above the spike gay feather and an underplanting of white carpet roses. The white rose blossoms will glisten at dusk. Of course, this new American style of gardening isn't limited just to palette of native plants. Plants from all over the world are used. You see, it's really more about how the plant feels in the landscape. Certainly, the plants have to offer color and texture through the seasons, and movement is also important. Of course, most of us don't have this much space to garden in this style, but you can come to a place like the Chicago Botanic Garden and get wonderful ideas on plant combinations to try in your own garden. This new American garden style is about planting with abundance, one of my 12 principles of garden design. One of the best examples I've seen of planting with abundance is the flower fields in Carlsbad, California. The color display is outrageous. You're looking at 50 acres of extraordinary color and bloom on a hillside overlooking the Pacific Ocean. This idea of planting with abundance really should be credited to Mother Nature. You see, if we look at natural settings, we often find plants growing in colonies or drifts. Now, if we take this idea into our own gardens, our plantings will look more spontaneous and natural. Let me use a favorite spring flower, the daffodil, to illustrate my point. When planted in naturalized drifts, these flowers look right at home. But when singled out in isolated pockets, the plants seem artificial and contrived. A more relaxed planting style, where plants are arranged in groupings of three, five, seven, or even more, is generally more pleasing to our eye than plants lined rigidly along the edges of a bed or lawn. 
Now there's no better way to get eye-popping color in your garden than to plant generously with lots of annuals. Some of the best for this effect are petunias and impatiens, geraniums and verbena. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that as a garden designer, I've discovered that making gardens is often about making bold statements. Now, I know the flower fields is an extreme example of this. After all, who has 50 acres of that kind of color? What I've discovered is no matter what size area you have to work with, you can always fill it with lots of color. I find that in limited space, one of the best ways to do this is just to use containers. I love to come to garden centers and nurseries like this to see what's in bloom, to come up with new and interesting combinations. Now here's an idea for a sun-loving container. In fact, it's a cluster of containers using plants that radiate abundance. When I choose plants for a container, I think of three different shapes. Something tall and spiky, something round and full, and something to cascade or spill over the edge. In this container, I chose a tall and spiky fountain grass. Ornamental grasses make great centerpieces for containers. They're so exuberant. Pink gara helps to soften the transition between the tall and spiky element and the round and full. You see, garas make good container plants because they're very drought tolerant. This lanai royal purple verbena rounds out the container and cascading over the edges is a sweet potato vine called Ace of Spades, this beautiful gray-leafed helichrysum, and trailing petunia called Ramblin lilac glow. Now to make this ensemble even more abundant, I've repeated two of the plants in the large composition, the Ace of Spades sweet potato and the Ramblin glow petunia, in smaller containers around the base. And as you can see, all together, they make quite a dramatic display. Now I want to say just a little more about those sweet potato vines. Over the past several years, you see them everywhere. Both the dark purple variety, Ace of Spades, which we just saw in the container, and the chartreuse colored one called Margarita. While they're fast growing annual ground covers, they can sometimes be a thug in the garden and in containers. So be prepared to cut them back. You know, whenever I advise design clients on being generous with planting, they inevitably ask, well, how will I know if I've planted too much? Wondering if there's a difference between excess and abundance. Well, frankly, I think there is a difference. You see, excess is when one element in the composition dominates everything else to the point it's a distraction. You see, I think abundance should be used in measured quantities. I think we live in an age when the operative message seems to be too much is just enough. But this philosophy isn't always in the garden's best interest, or our interest for that matter. If you contain your exuberant plantings within a framework, you'll be rewarded by a harmony created between the structure and the looser plant choices. Now one of the best reasons that I can think of to plant with exuberance and abundance is to be able to cut what's outside in the way of flowers and bring them indoors to enjoy. So make sure you plant enough in the garden so that when you cut from your display, you don't weaken it. Let me give you an example. I always pack in extra tulip and daffodil bulbs into drifts when I plant so that when I cut them for spring bouquets, I haven't destroyed their overall effect in the garden. Another trick is to plant equal numbers of early, mid, and late spring bloomers. By choosing varieties with different bloom times, you extend the impact of the display while maximizing the use of bed space. This technique will help you enjoy the flowers in waves of colors. One of the blessings of abundance is having enough to share with others. Some gardeners love to offer their vegetables to neighbors. Others plant a row for the hungry and give their surplus crops to local shelters. In both cases, the rewards of sharing makes the extra effort spent planting seem worthwhile. Of course, during the holidays, the spirit of giving is at its peak. But throughout the gardening season, giving pass-along plants to family and friends. Those are plants that have been handed from one gardener to the next is another way to be generous. You see, plants carry with them a sense of history, place, and nostalgia. One of my gardening friends was always very generous with the daylilies and iris he hybridized, as well as his favorite daffodils. He gave them to many of his friends and several gardening organizations. His plant gifts shine in gardens all through the city. 
As he shared the gifts from his garden, he left a legacy of his work, inspiring others to do the same. One of the ways I share plants from my garden is through cuttings. I can remember friends and family going through my grandmother's garden, taking cuttings by her instruction, rooting them and starting plants for their own gardens. You see, taking cuttings is one of the easiest ways to create new plants commonly done in the nursery business. In fact, just take a look at these little hydrangea plants. They were started from cuttings. What's amazing to me is that in only 12 weeks, these will be in full glorious bloom. Hydrangeas are one of the easiest plants to propagate by stem cuttings. I find that taking cuttings in mid to late summer is the best time. First, find a limb with about two or three leaf joints. Cut the stem just below a leaf joint and remove the lower leaves. If the cutting has any flower heads on it, they should be removed. Next, just wet the ends of the stem and then dip them down into some rooting powder. Then just stick the cuttings into moist soil where they'll remain for about six to eight weeks. Now it's important to remember that during this time of root development, you have to keep the soil consistently moist. Now once the plants are rooted, they can be transplanted into larger containers before planting in the garden next spring. Another great way to bring abundance to the garden is through wildflower seeds. And a great place to see wildflowers in all of their glory is at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Austin, Texas. Founded in 1982, its mission is to educate people about the environmental necessity, economic value, and natural beauty of native plants. Dr. Robert Brunig, executive director of the Wildflower Center and the director of horticulture, Denise Delaney, tells us more. Well, this uh, institution was founded by Lady Bird Johnson when she returned to Texas from her years in the White House. And of course, during her White House days, she was trying to encourage people to recognize the natural beauty of our country. And so when she came back to Texas, of course, she wanted to grow native plants and wildflowers. And she quickly became very frustrated by the fact that she couldn't find oftentimes the seeds of the wildflowers she wanted to grow or couldn't go to a nursery and find a native plant. So the idea was born that, hey, you know, I'm going to try to encourage this whole concept and encourage the growing of native wildflowers by founding an institution devoted to the research on and the education about native plants and wildflowers. Texas is known for its wildflowers and when you approach the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center you can't help but notice this, this wonderful fabric of colors all over the roadside. When you come onto the property there is just the most incredible diversity of species. Now we have the Texas Blue Bonnet as the state flower and Texans are very proud of that flower but there are so many other species that are just incredible and help set off the colors. Um, you might see paintbrush or these very beautiful orange. Um, you also see pink evening primrose. You'll see yellow coreopsis and they're all mixed in like a quilt along the roadsides. Going 65 miles down the road is, is one way to look at them but walking through the garden you can really see them up close. The whole idea of the architecture of the Wildflower Center is the um, connection between the human environment and the natural environment between natural heritage and cultural heritage. And so the architects that uh, built the Wildflower Center studied the vernacular architecture of Texas uh, and the different architectural styles from the Hispanic traditions, the German Hill Country traditions, the ranching traditions, and really blended them all together uh, in a very sensitive way and um, really creating uh, what I think is an almost perfect integration between the human environment and the natural environment. We've got a big job in front of us in this country. We're losing our native plants and wildflowers. And while that's sad, it's also joyful to be able to help educate people about those issues and try to do something about it. One time I saw a news reporter ask Mrs. Johnson why out of all the things that she chose as first lady to do, why did she choose wildflowers? And she just said one word, joy. Spreading this joy of gardening with wildflowers is Julie Holland of Holland Wildflower Farm. Julie produces and sells wildflower seeds to gardeners all across the country. Wildflowers can be defined in different ways. So we, we have our own definition that we feel is pretty correct. Wildflower is anything that will naturalize in an area given 
uh, a start. And so the plants that we grow and sell seeds for are ones that are either native to the United States and naturalized. And what a naturalized flower is, is one that did, or did not originate here, but that is maybe from Europe. Say Queen Anne's Lace is a, is a naturalized wildflower. It's originally from Europe, but it's certainly naturalized here so that it would fool you into thinking it's one of our native wildflowers. We make five different seed mixes. Um, Ozark Naturals is one of the most popular for the Ozark region and any other surrounding region of the Ozarks and they're native and naturalized wildflowers to much of the eastern United States so that's a good um, mix of things that are going to naturalize because they have done so already. Um, the butterfly wildflowers is our newest one and that's designed to attract butterflies. It's about I think 15 or 20 different wildflowers including Queen Anne's Lace, Butterfly Weed, Baby Blue Eyes and, and some others, the Dame's Rocket that's behind me. Planning a wildflower garden is a little bit different than just going to the garden center and picking out what looks pretty and plugging it into the ground. You have to kind of have some foresight and decide what the effect is that you want and then choose things that will grow in that area. Someone who's very familiar with Julie's wildflower seeds is Carl Hunter. Carl has penned several books, but is probably best known as the author of Wildflowers of Arkansas and for being the neighbor with the yard full of blooms. What's going on here is just an average uh, city lot. There's a lot larger and, and some smaller, but within a yard, if you pick all the different spots, shady spots and sunny spots and places that you can grow flowers, and there's a wide variety of areas that wildflowers will grow in that uh, a lot can be done just on a fairly small tract of land. So I like for people to know that when they come here. I'm growing 150 different species of wildflowers on this property. And I'm growing everything from plants that like almost no sun to plants that grow in full sun all the time. Because on the west side of the house, the sun comes in there hot in the afternoons and those are the sunflowers and things we see along the roadsides. But on the east side of the house, or the front of my house, uh, those plants, of course, are not in the sun in the afternoon because the sun goes behind the house. And on the north, I'm growing uh, some of the plants that uh, people don't get to see very often, like jack in the pulpit and green dragons and bellworts and all of those beautiful shade things that really will replace hostas and more colorful. But this is kind of like a shopping mart that you wander around and say, oh, I like that one or I like this one, and you get to see many different kinds, but not laid out as most people would landscape. It's a strange thing, but uh, in cultivated flowers or in arranging yards, many people uh, go through a lot of uh, thought as to whether they want reds with pinks and all different combinations. But in nature, all the colors are often together, and nobody thinks about this being a clash. So I don't think it makes a lot of difference what colors you use. Just use colors that you like to plant in your garden. And uh, here in this garden, I've, I've put all different kinds of flowers together for shade and sun, and I've put them in small groups so that you have lots of choices as to what you would like. And most of these things that you see here are readily available. I have not got rare things or unusual things. I've got things that are along the roadsides and out in the woods and are available even in local nurseries. For instance, black-eyed Susans and Coreopsis and many of these real common flowers are in every state in the Union. Another plant native to the Americas that I grow in my garden is Nicotiana, or flowering tobacco. Even though it's an annual, it's the kind I call a hardy volunteer, because once it's finished flowering, it drops its seed and comes back next year. Now the wild Nicotiana can grow quite tall and has an incredibly fragrant blossom, which attracts night pollinators. Now hybridizers have been at work creating beautiful garden variety flowering tobacco. I love this chartreuse colored one called Saratoga Lime and this pink variety called Apple Blossom. And I have to say that every time I plant one of these, I'm rewarded with abundant flowers that keep on giving. 
Well, we've certainly been all over the map in today's show, but I hope that many of the examples you've seen will inspire you to plant with abandon in your own garden. We've seen that even in the smallest containers you can have abundance and that you really can't plant too much. And hey, if you do, that just means you have more to share with others. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. on an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, there's something funny going on in our next show. We'll visit this estate on Long Island and learn about one little girl's birthday surprise and how it relates to the design principles of time and whimsy. Plus, we'll explore this mysterious garden and find out how your garden can get this look.